views and opinions expressed on Geeks Under the Influence are that of the panelists and not of our sponsors, Amazon.com and TeePublic. Parental discretion is advised. And it's unfortunate that I have such an obsession with Vincent Price because I want to watch all these other horror movies that we've talked about on the 31 Days of Halloween and, and check out new movies that are coming out. Every Halloween, there's new movies that are being released for the season. But Vincent Price's career is so full of great films that you could do a 31 days of Vincent Price and you'd end up going into the like the bikini girl movies and stuff that he did the, okay but those are fun <laughs> those are fun and do that's not even counting TV the 60s 70s romp movies where there was just like Peter Sellers standing in the corner of a fucking a, a, an apartment and there's just like 60s groove music playing and girls in bikinis dancing and then there's a conversation and then it's like oh yeah oh yeah just, just, just like that that, that, that reminded me of Beverly Hillbillies. So that, you know, <laughs> yeah. where, where the bikini girls all it's sped up. a very up. special episode of Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> yeah. Don't right. worry, we're going to recreate this scene so that way everyone can see like the gestures that were happening. We're going to yeah. do the, the GUI podcast, uh, 60s romp movie. <laughs> but it's no surprise nice. that Vincent Price, with that fucking mustache, that iconic mustache. The mustache and the voice. And the voice would mm-hmm. be in, in movies like that. But, I mean, thinking about... Vincent Price was there from the golden age like the early yeah. age of of horror to i mean through the 90s i mean literally like in edward scissorhands yeah <laughs> he's, he's yeah. one of the i yeah. think of him as a scream king oh, oh uh, yeah, he's, he's right there you look at bella lugosi uh, uh boris karloff vincent price goes right in there and i personally think christopher lee uh, goes right in that oh, list as well yeah, yeah, yeah. well i was yeah. gonna say he, he, he i always yes yeah. i put Vincent Price in the same caliber as like Christopher Lee or Peter Cushing that like that level of where they weren't now granted Lee did play a lot of monsters due to Hammer and then you mentioned Bela Lugosi and all those guys they were iconic horror monsters but then we had the how horror evolved after that and we go into where we have these individuals that are just like in it for what they can bring to being creepy. Yeah, they're not just spooky. prosthetic monster yeah, exactly. people anymore. It's, it's, yeah. the human, it's the human aspect, right? Right, and I think that's part of what's really unique about Vincent Price and part of what his longevity is as a figure because where, you know, like, we do recognize Lugosi and we do recognize Boris and, you know... Um, Cheney and... Cheney and, you know, and, yeah. and Christopher Lee and all that, but we often also associate them with a specific character and while Vincent has a few of those... When you say Vincent Price, there's a whole like fanned out menagerie of things that could come to mind because he is he is iconic as Vincent Price, mm-hmm. and I think that's part of what makes him. Um, and I I feel like there are there are, are obviously like people from this era that you know have carried over in that similar tradition. Like I would say that Robert England is recognizable as Robert England. Yes, um, now he is. Now that he level. is. Yeah. It took a little while for that. Yeah. 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 It took a little while, but but Vincent Price also took a little while because, you know, we're talking about a man that's got over a hundred films, let alone other things. Yeah. Yeah. And and Vincent Price, the thing with him, because he's been acting for, he had been acting for so long, I guess it depends on how old you are, what you would know him from. Because my personal introduction to him was Thriller. So I, like, I was a little kid. Thriller was my introduction to horror. And so when I heard his voice, I thought, well, I'm terrified right now, and I'm hearing this voice. This is the voice of horror. So it established for me immediately uh, that this is what horror is, and Vincent Price was a beginning. It, it, was, it was this establishment of that in my entire life. So, yeah. How fucking iconic do you have to be to be featured on not only a Michael Jackson record as like the voice of the horror that is Thriller, and also be on an Iron Maiden record. <laughs> yeah, <no laughs> and Alice Number Cooper. Of, Alice and Cooper. Alice Cooper. Like, holy shit. Yeah. 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 Like, and, and that's the level that we're talking about on this episode. We're talking, of course, about Vincent Price. It's a far overdue mm-hmm. episode mm-hmm. of our uh, Pottoween season episodes where we talk all things spooky. Um, Vincent Price is iconic in so many different ways for so many different roles that he's played over the years. Getting into those roles, we're going to be talking about the man himself. Uh, his life and what he meant to all of us on this episode of Geeks Under the Influence. All things Vincent Price, welcome! Ha 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 ha! Oh, buddy.
<laughs> Oi. Uh, so welcome. Yeah, I'm I'm super juiced to talk about this. I mean, this is tough to put into one episode, but again, a lot of the Halloween episodes tend to be that way. Yes. It's such yeah. a, a beloved uh, genre. We all so have deep seated the... Halloween issues. <laughs> Very much. <laughs> but are they issues? I don't I don't know. Where it's like it's July it's like mid July and I'm like <laughs> spooky season. <laughs> like, no, like, no, it's no almost here. It's, it's not like yeah. the height of summer yet, and I'm like, spooky season? But it's like, not, it's the whole thing. Like I'm like, okay, it's, it's July. So I technically have one more month before I'm like, all right, I know it's still hot in December r- relatively, but it's it's September. Like I'm through the I'm through the summer season. Yeah. So in July, I'm like, I got one more month. And well, as soon like, as Halloween's <laughs> over, I'm going to be like, okay, what am I going to do next Halloween? Yep. <laughs> yep. What am I going to be? But yeah, mm-hmm. I feel like spooky season for me is like September 1st through October 31st <laughs> is you got two solid months of just being spooky and you're good to go. Yeah, only mm-hmm. two months. That's yep. totally all. No, I no, I just be down. spooky year round, but it's like spooky dedicated between those two months. No, where... you got to extend mm-hmm. that out further because you got to think about like when that horror con season starts, man. That's true. Horror yeah, con that's... season is all year round. Yeah. <laughs> and Halloween is I, I got you. All right, all right. <laughs> but let's, let's talk about our Steve panel that is uh, bringing the noise and the funk on this uh, Vincent Price episode. A uh, for a while, it's been a while since we've had Fabian on, but he is here to talk all things mm-hmm. Vincent Price. I am so happy to be back. Yay! <laughs> yes. Uh, first time in the new studio. Yes, so I, I love this place. It's beautiful. I, I, it's, I love this studio, too. Yeah. yeah. So I've been away, I guess, because of COVID. Yeah. I mean, I mean, COVID kind of shut down the world, shut yep. down my life, certainly. And yeah. There were definitely moments where I felt like Vincent Price in Last Man on Earth. <laughs> yes, actually, that was... Where I, I saw the people <laughs> roaming the streets being like, you don't need a mask. COVID <laughs> has microchips in it. And, and, yeah. <laughs> I was like, nope, close the curtain. <laughs> like, yeah, Ugh. they're all zombies now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, Fabian, thank you for coming back on for it, this it is episode. wonderful to be back. Thank you so much for having uh, me. If you're unfamiliar, Fabian, Fabian is a, well, multifaceted uh, artist of photography, filmmaking, uh, music. Uh, you've got, I think it's November 12th, Synthetic Nightmares doing another show. Yes, yes. Yeah. We're going to do our first show since uh, since COVID started. Yay. So it's, it's going to be interesting. <laughs> It's weird that that seems like 45 years ago. Yeah. That before pre COVID, but it was like only a few years ago. But yeah. It time, does make a difference. Time time gets real weird yeah. when you're stuck in your house and things that you like to do for fun are shut down. I believe Doctor yeah. Who shit a little bit easier now. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Timey wimey. Timey wimey as fuck. Oh yeah. Yeah, but um yeah, November 12th at Fallout, uh, Synthetic Nightmare with the dude that does the uh the Barry disappointed White yeah, what is it? Barry White Hanson. Barry White Hanson. He does that disappointed song that's super <laughs> fucking funny. Oh, nice. Um, but yeah, next up, uh, an entertainer in their own right as well, and a co-host on Beautiful Disasters. We've got yeah. Murphy Lawless here. Hi, friends. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. A horror nerd extraordinaire as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a little bit ravenous <laughs> for it. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I love in the early days of Murphy coming on would be like, I don't know if I like know enough about this thing with 14 pages of notes, <laughs> like ready to roll. I've tried to scale back. I've I've let myself do only one page of notes because um, Groots was like, Murph, we can hear your pages turning. And I was like, okay. Well, that's yeah. the funny thing is uh-huh. like the longer you do this, the less you realize how, uh, like the, the less you worry about like doing research. Like I look over at my co-host here and me and like, We've done shit for this. Like maybe watched a movie or two tops, like tops. For this. That, that's yeah. actually what I was worried about. Okay. I came in here and I looked over at your no, notebook, that, your notepad. Then I'm like, oh boy, I didn't Murph. do. This is, like, just, <laughs> yeah. this is just who this I am. Is, I did not bring a notebook. No. Except right. it and <laughs> I'm just going to speak from the heart and talk yeah. about thriller. <laughs> no, no, that's fair. But I found a bunch of really cool stuff, and it's and it's awesome. And if you look in the actually through the Wikipedia links, there's like a huge like lifelong interview with him that Smithsonian did. That's wow. super worth downloading and reading. Oh, that's amazing. So, yeah. I'm still there working would be my way because he's it. lived a his career is such so expansive. Yeah. That I mean to really hope to not put it all into one. Uh, you know, to cover it in a podcast oh, yeah, yeah, it's is going to be a lot. Yeah. I mean, we could talk about this for p- days. Yeah. I mean, it's honestly, some, like mini we, series of yeah. episodes. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Just because he has just done so much. And uh, even outside of horror, mm-hmm. like, yes. he's done so yeah. much. That's where yeah. it gets daunting. I know him f- from a horror Primary background horror. because yeah. I'm obsessed with horror. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But knowing that he was such an art artiste and uh, like and so many things outside of 
what each of us appreciate him for exactly uh, it's it gets daunting he definitely was described as a renaissance male man and i absolutely agree with that like yeah Vincent definitely Price, uh, well he didn't he didn't um he didn't pick and choose if it was something yeah. that he saw that was interested in he would go for it he would mm -hmm. do it yep and that's yeah, yeah. you know uh, and the gentleman that is of uh, in line with me on being like research <laughs> <laughs> I, we, right. I mean i literally I mean, and all of us, like, I grew up with this Yeah, that's guy, the thing. So I didn't I'm have like, to worry nah, too much about I'm this not, one. But, uh, like, yeah, my, my partner in crime here, Lowdown Brown MacGyver. What's going on, everybody? Yeah. Uh, and to uh, piggyback off of uh, pre-intro, what Fabian said about Thriller, that was actually, like, the third thing for me. Like, Murph and I were talking outside earlier. My very first intro was when I went to see Edward Scissorhands in the theater, mm -hmm. but I was oh. also, like, five yeah. when yeah. that movie came out. And then it was Batman 66. Because I watched oh. the show. That oh, show. He, he was Egghead. egghead. Yeah, yeah. He was Egghead. Yeah. So I recognized the voice. Then I'm like, oh, hey, he was the guy. Because he's way older than ever. Scissor hands, mm -hmm. right? We're talking 30 years, you know, yes. roughly 30 years. It was one of the last films you know? he did. Yeah. Yeah. So we're looking at 30 some years. And then I really got into Michael Jackson in my right around like eight, nine, mm -hmm. 10, that whole era. Yeah. And that's when, like, because they used to run that, um, they used to run a lot of marathons of Michael Jackson back then. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys remember that, but like, oh, I remember. They would, oh, yeah. they would show the full thriller. They would show the Moonwalker short film, oh, all yeah. that stuff. So I was constantly seeing the full. I was a teenage werewolf ripoff of thriller video. Yes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Which, hey, I, no problems with that at all. Yeah. It, it went from that to zombies. And I'm like, cool. I love Michael Landon's I was a teenage werewolf and I love zombies. So we're, we're, we're good. It's genius. <laughs> you know, but yeah. So that was actually the third thing that, and then obviously down the rabbit hole as I got older. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, every, I think everyone on this panel probably went through a Vincent Price rabbit hole at some point mm -hmm. in their life where just, what else? Give me. And then I went, and then I found Dr. Goldfoot and the mm -hmm. Bikini Girls bikini and, <laughs> and the Bikini Machine. And... and and the man who confuses his surf music with dueling banjos, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mike the Hobbit Bicket here. When you're hanging by the lake, it could be either one. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's true that it's a very fine line. Yeah, it's right. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, for Vincent Price, yeah, I I want to say probably House on Haunted Hill was one of the first introductions that I had. Um, nice. and there was, I've spoken this, but I think probably every Halloween season I mentioned that uh, grew up without cable, um, didn't have a lot of opportunity to watch a lot of the scarier stuff. But my mom had this idea that if it was in black and white, it was safe. I was like, <laughs> safe. So I'd go <laughs> I'd go to the <laughs> library, and that's how I discovered like Night of the Living Dead and like all these classic movies. And House yeah. on a Hill was definitely in that list of movies where, oh, yeah. um. Man, that moment, that moment that uh, the lights turn off and turn on and there's the witch woman like in yeah. the, 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 the housekeeper get, gets wheeled out and it's the cheesiest shit you've ever seen. That, and then the skeleton that's walking, that's yes, that Vincent William Price's Castle. controller. Oh my God, Beautiful. it's so fun. I actually saw this film after seeing Evil Dead and I'm like, oh, this is uh, inspiration for Sam Raimi. Because that housekeeper, when she floats, oh, yeah. that's, that is like a oh, Raimi definitely. thing. Yeah. But definitely. you could just totally see where Raimi got some of his inspiration from going mm -hmm. into the, yeah. Oh, 100%. The Deadites. Yeah. Like, and especially like the filming styles and the, the frugality and the promotion style of both, I would say both Castle and Corman, which, you know, po, uh, po, blip, Vincent Price worked with both of them. Yes. Um, I, I think my, my first exposure, like we were talking about outside, was definitely like, seeing Edward Scissorhands and being like, I really like this dude's voice. You know, he clearly is being treated like he's someone special. Who the fuck is this dude? And then, you know, recognized his voice from Thriller and a ton of the other metal songs that I listened to. <laughs> and then my mom and dad, I realized, kept quoting The Fly and going, yes. help me, help me. <laughs> and I was like, what are y'all doing? That was so good. And so they, oh. they were just like, oh, we'll show you. <laughs> but it, uh, just speaking of on Edward Scissorhands specifically, the time period when they came out, right, you know, we were all young, but these were also, we also had young cast and we had a young aspiring writer-director mm -hmm. in Tim Burton. Imagine what it was like for them to get fucking Vincent Price. A, Tim Burton as the film, as the creator, like, I've got this motherfucker in my, in my film. And then Johnny Depp, who had only done, what, like, three movies prior to that? Oh, yeah. That, mm -hmm. And that weren't big. And, like, I actually have a scene, two scenes with... Vincent Price, like yeah. I couldn't even imagine yeah, let's how get the that kid from Jump Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I couldn't even imagine how that feels right. like 
Vincent Price. This is the like, second time that Burton had worked with Vincent Price, actually, because for his like one of his first shorts, he oh, did the Vincent, Vincent short, yes. yeah, the, oh, where he got Vincent right. Price yeah. to narrate because it's about a kid that wants to be just like Vincent. He must Price. have been so starstruck. Oh my god, that's, I, that's well, what I'm thinking. That was, like, that, was a, you... that was a personal story that he was telling because you know that Tim Burton. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's, oh, that's yeah. also something that he played with in Ed Wood is that Ed Wood's relationship with Bela Lugosi oh, yes. was the same kind of relationship that he had with Vincent Price in his later mm-hmm. years as well. There's this very, very clear parallel between mm-hmm. the two. Oh yeah. So, Minus the morphine addiction, thankfully. Well, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, it's exactly like just yeah. that's, oh man, that's just a thing that I, yeah. <laughs> you know, it is really fascinating how how everything what we're talking about right now, how we're following the trail of say, Vincent Price inspiring Tim Burton, inspiring the next generation. Mm-hmm. The way this the torch is passed uh, is incredible because you look at, um, gosh, it, it's almost too hard to say where I'm going with this, but it's just <laughs> exciting to watch uh, who's inspiring who because mm-hmm. here I am as a filmmaker, deeply inspired by Tim Burton, uh, mm-hmm. always knowing about Vincent Price, but Vincent Price, when I was a kid, he was so much older at that point that, yeah, seeing him in Edward Scissorhands, it was nice to see him not as a scary person, but mm-hmm. seeing him so differently. I'm like, wow, this is the same guy as from Thriller. Mm-hmm. So it's just fascinating to watch these transformations happen yeah. over time and watch how the inspiration gets passed along. Yeah. Well, it's interesting warm. how that inspiration uh, hits at different points in our lives, especially now versus when we were growing up. And we're of the generation that we're kind of in that like exennial range of like later Gen X or early millennial mm-hmm. uh, range. So for a lot of us, I know this is true for my for me, I didn't look at horror. I found horror as a genre and I loved it. And so I was getting everything from Scream to Nosferatu thrown at me at the same time. And I was Mm -hmm. like just gobbling all of it up at the same time. So I was getting Vincent Price and slasher films from the 80s and, and, you know, modern slasher, like slasher meta movies and everything all at once. And I had to do the thing where you're you're see you're watching a movie and then finding out where the inspiration came from and then watching those movies and working your way back uh, and finding even more. Kids nowadays are being assaulted with so much content all the time that it's almost more difficult to find the roots of what you like because here's another shiny thing. Mm-hmm. Like there's constantly new content in your face all the time that finding those back roads to the origins of of inspiration is way more difficult for kids yes. nowadays than it was for us. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just respond to that real fast. Uh, you know, I think that we are seeing a, ri- a rise in like, I guess I'll call them like homage movies where they have tons of Easter eggs and they're like, they're definitely things that you can trace back to specific films. Like if you've, if you've already viewed those things or as you're viewing, you know, older films, you're like, I get what they were doing now. But, you know, we've always had stuff like that, especially with things like, I'll just say like The Simpsons and Futurama for one, because yeah. those are two. Simpsons f- always. Yeah. yeah. Treehouse of um, Horror Tree is House always. Treehouse of Horror, yeah. Just, yes. But those, those Easter eggs and those things that are beloved will always be included. And mm-hmm. sometimes they'll be more heavily included um, and like almost like not to the point of montage, but, you know, it's one of those things. But one of the things that I really found interesting recently and... um another another um podcast i was listening to brought it up as well so i know that i I know that i'm not crazy but like the parallels between the way that vincent price's character orchestrated things in the dr fives movies compared Mm. to how the saw movies orchestrated things Mm. and while we don't dip into torture porn with dr fives we get all of these machinations and people being punished for for other sins and like chances to atone but like prices have to be paid and things like that and, you know, all of this while, you know, we're like, Dr. Fives is clearly in the wrong because he's murdering people, you know, uh, from a, like a sheer morality stance, like, mm-hmm. you shouldn't murder people, kids. Um, but also, <laughs> like, I wanted him to win. I wanted him to win in both of those movies, even mm-hmm. though he's like trapping people in fun, like being like, so you've got X amount of time till this acid destroys their face. Best of luck. Um, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, I would even go as far to say that there are some elements of the Mask of Red Death in mm-hmm. the movie Doomsday. Oh, yeah. Because it's talking about like a massive plague and then there's like almost like what's happening within the castle is more dangerous than what's happening mm-hmm. like in the in the plague world. Like there is some, it's not the same story. It's not a remake or anything, but there are like little, oh, yeah. like dabblings of um, within both. Well, um, I mean that, that the 
exponential, um, you know, reverberations of the beginning of Poe, and then especially like the Poe Corman cycle, of which Price was such a major component Huge. of so many of those films. Um, you know, th- those echoes, I-, I can't even begin to start tracing all of the different things that those touch and affected, because I definitely think that like we wouldn't have like a lot of like what we're looking at as far as like Jeffrey Combs and yes. things like that mm-hmm. without that cycle. Yep. Yeah. And it's still, it's, it's a fun thing to acknowledge just how, how that's being passed along. And, you know, uh, earlier when we were talking about how it's this new generation, it's kind of harder for them to find the origins of what they're really enjoying. Well, it, there was a time like around this time with say Vincent Price and Boris Karloff and all of them, Horror was just horror. Everything was kind of a gothic horror. Mm-hmm. And now we have all these different genres yep. within horror mm-hmm. uh, that they had to have spinoffs because Vincent Price was probably among the first to be uh, an attractive villain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and like, so you finally, you're starting to see him play villains that, uh, that we like this guy and we want to root yeah. for this guy. And that's something that, you know, you never really wanted to do prior to that. Yeah. And so now we have all these nice spinoffs. So now we've got our torture porn g- mm-hmm. genre. We've we've got our gothic horror which, and our classic horror, which is where I think everybody kind of lumps Vincent Price these days, along with a lot of those those older guys. We all think of them as the well, older guys. To be fair, Vincent yeah. Price did play the Invisible Man or the brother of the Invisible mm-hmm. Man, yeah. I think Invisible Man Returns. Yes, yes, he did. So, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> it, it's technically not like the first appearance of that character but that's still i mean that's still early days true yeah. universal mm-hmm. yes oh yeah yeah i mean i remember and then like after thriller so this is only like a year or two after that i don't know if anybody remembers um you know sci-fi back in the day used to do a whole run through october and each week would be a specific actor. Oh, like they okay. would do a Peter Cushing week or they would do a Christopher Lee week. And every year would rotate, right? They'd do a Bella Ghost week. They had a Vincent mm-hmm. Price week one year. And every night, I can't remember if it was one or two films. They would play one or two films from that specific actor. So when they had a Vincent Price you know, week, I mean, that's when I, we, yeah, Murph and you and I were talking about the Tales of Terror. Mm-hmm. That's when mm-hmm. I saw that. Um, and Fibes and uh, The Fly. That's when I saw all that. So that was... There was ways to get to realizing where everything came from back when we were younger. Uh, mm-hmm. that's, that's what I was trying to tie that together. Like, I was, that was the 90s. Like, I was, you know, you know there's a lot of shitty ones in the early 90s, but I was, <laughs> I was, you know, really cut my teeth in horror on 80s, 80s mm-hmm. slasher stuff. That's, yes, you know, that same was Same here. And, but then going back, and, and that and my, my Uncle Bud, had all the Universal Monster movies that he would lend me so I could watch. So, like, I had avenues. But outside of that, there was still stuff being broadcasted that was Mm -hmm. the old stuff. So you had avenues. I don't really know with the surplus and just the the amount of stuff out there now, I don't know what how they can find an avenue and, and just chop down through the weeds to get to find the sources and yeah, do that that timeline back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's where podcasts and and um, streaming services come in because, like, gypodcast.com. dot yeah. com. <laughs> should we, should we, should we yeah. rip off Expedia? Gypodcast.com. dot com. dot com. Oh my god, you guys are gonna kill me! But like, I think so. <laughs> oh no! I'm gonna bop my forehead into this microphone. <laughs> um, but you know, I feel like it's also worth pointing out that like the Vincent Price entering the horror world happened during that universal cycle like it still happens so like um you know film debut in 1938 not a horror film um it was a uh, service deluxe and then i it was a porn list. actually oh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. i'm going i'm going to give you service it was post code so it wasn't a very it good wasn't horror bad, actually um i i've never seen service deluxe actually no i was talking about your your... Oh my, my Vincent Price. That wasn't terrible, actually. Okay. Yeah, I've heard worse. <laughs> Not terrible is about the best I can ever expect from one of my impressions, so I'll take it. <laughs> but um, the f- I would definitely call like they talk about House of Wax being one of his first like oh, big horror films, which is so good, though. amazing, so and I love it. Good. But I feel like we're missing out on a chance to include like the first film that he was like given top billing on, which was Shock in 1946. Let me see that. And it's definitely more of. Like, it's like a thrillery. It's or pulp. A, a little bit more like noiry, 
um, because she, a woman witnesses Vincent Price kill his wife, and it sends mm. her into with like mustache, catatonic is shock. <laughs> yeah. um, just with rips it off and beats her in the head yeah. with it. Yeah, it's yeah. It was I, really. I use this as a whip. That you lost it. Wait, rips yeah, off that was, the he rips yeah, off the mustache, the mustache and beats his wife with the mustache. Yeah. Yeah, it just she he hit her in the head, so instead of getting off, she died. Well, let's see. Uh, I don't yeah. have a I don't have a no, whip around you, no, me. Um, you, you, no, no, but no, I, tried I shouldn't too have said much, anything. I should have left it alone. Yeah, I should. I, should, I shouldn't okay. have said anything, and then we it'd still be good. So, <laughs> yeah, something. cool. Your fault. Anyway. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so later on, we have to do our all do our Vincent Price impressions. No. Yeah. Oh no! Um, no, no. <laughs> no! I'm with Fabian. No, but, you know, <laughs> oh, no, I've got one. It's just bad, and I want to hear all of them. Um. But she goes into catatonic shock, so they call the doctor, and he is the doctor they call, and he's, like, trying to treat her, and then realizes why she's in shock, and so then it's this back-and-forth play um, of, like, does he actually try to treat her, or does he try to, like, suppress this memory, or try to drive her insane, and his mistress that, who he was leaving his wife for, is, like, trying to urge him to take, like, definitely not the best path and mm-hmm. so she's kind of, like, the femme fatale character. It's it's interesting. It's worth a watch. It's I think basically it's Gone Girl. But with Vincent, Pr- no, I'm kidding. Well, that, <laughs> but it's it's definitely something Vincent that Vincent Price because uh, it's gets cr- pregnant and it's a uh, no. Thank you, uh, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but you know what what you bring yeah, up a good point and, and, and things like what, that. What you're making me think is that you know it's just cool how Vincent Price went across so many genres because oh, yeah. right now you're fil- talking about the film noir and the 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 thriller aspects of some of the work he did as opposed yeah. to things like The Fly. Mm-hmm. Which is, I, I'd look that at that as a science fiction, uh, yeah. a science fiction horror. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the early, flavor. one of the yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, like, well, OG being Frankenstein, that was I think to I, oh, I yeah. consider the OG mm-hmm. sci-fi horror. Yes, ab- right. absolutely. I mean, Mary Shelley was uh, oftentimes mentioned as like the beginning of sci-fi. Yes, really. yes. Yeah. and she was a genius. Uh, so, she was a genius to write. Know what that. She did. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Oh yeah, well, yeah. You know, most people, you know. There were a lot of males named Mary back yes. then, so people. You think, <laughs> of course, you think a bunch assume. of men that were walking around. No, it was H. G. Mary's. Wells. Fuck off. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. but yeah, uh, but they, they so. but this this cross genre talent that he had, and mm-hmm. he he was perfect in every single one of these roles, oh, yeah. uh, and it was just so he was very impressive. But then going back to the genre itself, watching the evolution of horror is just mm-hmm. an exciting thing, and and when I think about that, like. When you watch how one genre feeds into another, mm-hmm. like I now correct me if I'm wrong, because I might be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure I at least heard this. Uh, if the movie The Tingler, before, the Tingler. before, uh, um, Alice in Wonderland, uh, no, not Alice in Wonderland, that with Dorothy and the the Wizard, Wizard of Oz, the Wizard of Oz, Wizard of Oz. yeah. Um, th- so The Tingler was like the introduction of color. In film, wasn't it? No, the wizard. So the Wizard of Oz is the introduction. It was the f- the first Technicolor film. Um, the Tingler. Um, we did see the return of. No, that was Thirteen Ghosts. Sorry, I fucked that up. I was thinking about Margaret Hamilton. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh I no, no, no you. problem. Uh, because if <laughs> no. I, I might be wrong, and, and but I feel the like Tingler I... used the um, the William Castle gimmick of um, it was electro, which yes. the, the buzzers under the seats. The oh, buzzers yeah. under the seats, but parts of the movie were in color. I don't remember. Wasn't it being there in like color. I? There was the the, mo- the movie was black and white, and there were parts of the Tingler that um, like there the blood was in color. Uh, so I've never so, seen the Tingler. So the so Tingler, uh, you are correct. The blood. It was. Uh, it was a black and white movie, but the bloody bathtub oh, scene in right. the Tingler was uh, the filmed in black yes. and white, but a short when color sequence was spliced into the film. To... Yes, so that yeah. was that was the introduction of color to film, and and so of course, so for them to do that before Wizard of Oz, nope, I mean that is that's, that's post Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz is like thirties. Okay, well pretend I didn't even bring up <laughs> Wizard of Oz because none of that happened. I'm but sorry. but yeah, the Tingler. Well, okay, no, no. The reason I brought up the Tingler is because I like LSD, and yeah. I thought that the LSD scene in there was incredible. Vincent Price doing LSD. In the Tingler. Oh my God! Yeah, that was grade A. Um, <laughs> anybody who's seen the Tingler knows oh, yeah. that if you're so having, you, you recommend the Tingler is what you're saying. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was just a good time Especially watching him watching with friends. The yeah, horror, never, the just, horror, and then and then collapsing the way he did is. Oh, no, I will say priceless. The, the Tingler. The, the, is it about a bug? The, the big ball. difference is that in the Tingler there is a black and white scene with a color element, um, yes. very much in like. 
Mm-hmm. I, I hate to use Schindler's as, as an example, but where there's just the red coat mm-hmm. oh, in a yeah. black and white sequence, yeah. that's yeah. a little different than Wizard of Oz, where there was slightly that in the in-between, but then it was all color. Yeah. You know, it, it yeah, had that hard into the... turn, whereas mm-hmm. this had a black and white scene with color elements included. So it is a slightly different use. Well, I, mean, I feel like I've seen like clips from this movie because that picture of Vincent Price with the this weird thing on his chest. Is... Oh, yeah, that's the tingler. That, so that's basically, the tingler. The, 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 this creature called the tingler grows on the spine of every human and the way that you kill it and you get it to shrink back down is by screaming and it happens when you're scared so oh um, my god and so (laughs) and so normally people are safe from this creature but if if someone would say like mute and had, didn't have vocal cords and couldn't scream that tingler could kill them and escape yeah. which is what happens and that's where we get watch that out all like, you mutes like that's oh the, yeah and, and, and you know on top of it you Wall know Wall Wall people Wall are Wall creeped out by parasites oh yeah and sure. so the tingler was this this spine. overly yeah this overly creepy Ooh. creature that would grow inside your body yeah. rip out and then it would crawl through the movie theater and they would yeah. show it in the movie theater and it was and then the, then in the movie theater they would shake your seat and, yeah, and, and like it, like the yeah. creature was underneath you, and so it would make people scream their heads off. Yep. Yeah. So I, I wonder, and I'm, I'm sure it is, but I love the I love how we're you know it's uh, utilizing Vincent Price while talking about the the inspirations moving forward. I wonder if this was like an inspiration for Shivers from Cronenberg. There's a oh, lot of possibilities. Could have easily yeah, been very yeah. much um, easily, I mean, easily. You know? that one's more sexuality driven. Well, that's Cronenberg. Well, that's, well, that's, that's Cronenberg. No, no, <laughs> you know that know. that's part of that's part of the evolution. <laughs> Everybody gets gets what the previous generation and did, they and then they add thing their own they, thing. They, yeah. right. Cronenberg made things sexual. Uh, Clive Barker made things. Really awesome, <laughs> and, 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 uh, and you know everybody comes along and they take what came before them and then they they spice it up with their own personality. Yeah, exactly. Cronenberg's oh, yeah. like, ooh, I love the like weird like sixties, late fifties, sixties like buzzer button kind of movies mm-hmm. and all that. That's yeah. great. But what if we include that into what it's like to fuck a sunburn? Like <laughs> yeah. if, we could, oh, God, if we could include those things together, then yeah. yeah. Well, and also uh, these movies, also the William Castle movies that he was in, especially had a huge effect on John Waters too. Oh yeah, so, mm. you know this is like yeah. a transgender. I, I mean, thing. just mustache alone. Uh, uh, John <laughs> Waters' mustache is much slimmer. Than uh, much slimmer, yeah. For sure. he's got the pencil. Yeah, the yeah. Pencil but the inspiration. There's even stuff that you don't think about that I I remember this. I don't know why it's in my brain, but the voice the. Uh-huh. That from the, uh, the from fly. the fly, yeah. yeah. Uh, that is how you got Howie Mandel doing Bobby's World. Yes, oh, is that nice. he was doing an imp- he used to do an impression of the fly in a stand up set, <laughs> and then he was approached about doing some kind of like cartoon or something, and so he came up with Bobby Jenneric from uh, doing that's his fly. Impression. Really fucking cool. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I mean that that is that, yeah. that's fucking really is because I watched the show uh, Bobby's World when I was oh, younger. Yeah. So oh yeah. Oh, we all did. That was. <laughs> <laughs> An elephant yeah. never forgets a friend. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, that's that's all these yeah. movies touch us all. Everybody is watching the same movies. You would think that, I think that's one of the things that separates low budget independent horror out from, from, well, no, I said that wrong. There are some movies that go way under the radar. And then there are the ones that say Vincent Price was in that we all saw. Everybody saw them. Mm-hmm. And so everybody's imitating them. So in the case of something like Bobby's Word World, you're a little kid. You're watching this thing. You have no idea that this was a character inspired by something Vincent Price right? did. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'd so rather than being like low budget, you'd say like these films were became accessible. Yes, like these are these yeah. are something that became more accessible. accessible. A lot yeah. of them were low budget, but well, yeah, but, but they were still making a huge name for themselves. And the truth is, when you're doing horror, you don't. You don't need a high budget. Right. You can do something with a really low budget, and as long as it's memorable, like mm-hmm. uh, you look at Evil Dead, ultra low budget, and yet hugely successful, yeah. and everybody knows it. And but, again, mm-hmm. the Mormons. Also, stuff. thinking about the time, you're talking the 1950s and 60s. This is well before people even had like reel to reels in their house. Uh, there was no way to take the film home with you, really, at this point. So mm-hmm. these movie houses would have just runs of movies for years. Like if, yeah. if like House on a Haunted Hill, I'm just, I'm, I don't have any facts about that specifically, but would run through picture houses for like a decade of mm-hmm. being in and out during Halloween season, come back through because that was the only way you were going to see it. There was no other way to watch this right. movie. So the longevity there, that's why they pumped out these movies and that's why they were successful because literally people just wanted more content. There wasn't enough films being made. So the shelf life of these things were insane. Yeah. So everybody got a chance over a period of five, ten years to see this movie. So that's another point. difference we've got. We've the shelf life isn't there no, like talking about. Not 
the well, same. we also don't have as many directors that four wall theaters these days that they did like they did in, in these where they would basically take their film from town to town. Like Kevin Smith has been doing that a lot. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you go and like they would go and they promote and they would, you know, basically like buy out, rent out the theater to show their film and do it that way. Be like, OK, you're not going to distribute my film. I'll fucking do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah. you know, like we also um, I I know that i've watched this but i i don't have a ton of memories from it but he was also in like the 10 commandments yeah like, yeah and <laughs> wow, in the he middle was, of yeah. all of these you know and yeah. and obviously like my biggest connection to vincent price has been the horror movies um but i definitely think that it, it's worth mentioning that like when he was first cast like his first entree i guess if you wish to say it that way to like the theater realm of being like a leading man was in victoria regina and on the theater um at the gate theater and um he was you know looked at when he was going to start doing like more theater and movies as a potential romantic lead because he was he was six foot four he was handsome and one of the things i watched definitely made a comment about him being six foot four with long legs doing these like renaissance uh plays with in tights and a cod piece and how it didn't hurt box office and he does have those dreamy blue eyes he does but, uh, but, and let's be and, and that's uh, also and starting in black and white and then they go to color and like oh better yeah it, it's like <laughs> there were no, we, there, a lot of those lead men back mm-hmm. then like they weren't six four no they, vincent vincent was no, no that's what i'm saying like that that made yeah. him stand even more it's like there were not a lot of out. six yeah. four t- actors yeah like, no 100 you know, and, and you then know, you add everything you said you add everything else that he had and yeah. the thing about vincent price he was uh i wa- noticed this watching his movies when he's not playing a villain he s- comes across as such a sweet man like mm-hmm. for example when you watch the fly Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I know that's a horror movie, but he's not the bad guy in that movie. Yeah. No, he's, no. he's not a scary element. So he's just this guy. First of all, the first thing I noticed about that movie is that this woman kills his brother and he's really supportive of her. And like he goes over to the house and he goes, oh, but I love I love my my sister-in-law and I, I love my my brother and she killed him i don't understand how this could be are you okay i'm like well <laughs> fuck you you killed my brother <laughs> so, but but yeah so he comes across as so sweet and he has that smile and he's he's got a very sweet face and a very sweet approach mm-hmm. to people and the way he speaks yeah he's and, just very uh, approachable well and i do want to uh, approach that on our second half we're right at the break here mm-hmm. about kind of the nature of his character, like uh, as a person that he held himself very, uh, very softly. And he, and he wasn't a angry screamer type villain. He was was warm, warm and he, and he spoke softly Yeah, and he spoke with intention. And there was something about that, that as we go into like the seventies and eighties, where it was Mm -hmm. a much more visceral, hard kind of approach to the villains. Mm -hmm. Um, he still made it through that era and he made it out on the other mm-hmm. side into like the early nineties until he passed that he was still, yeah. he, he never had to compromise his approach to that kind of role. And yes. that, that's something super interesting. And also yeah. talking about it, like his sexuality that came, came out um, in Recently, the past few years yeah. from his daughter's book. And mm-hmm. I, I'm, I want to get into that on the second half, but let's take a break. Mm-hmm. When we come back, we're going to be talking about uh, what we're drinking, some sponsor stuff and get back into Vince's price. So stick around. We'll be right back. Coming straight from the mouths of madness, I'm Lowdown. I'm F.U. Hunter. Do you love horror? We fucking do. So this is a podcast dedicated to all things in cinematic horror. We're talking movies, television, composers, special effects artists. We're going to fucking cover it. So if you love horror, embrace the madness. My name is Amy Bogard. And I'm Mike the Hobbit. And we are the hosts of Deeply Upsetting, where we use our expertise to answer your most upsetting hypothetical quandaries, such as what non wigged animal deserves wings? And what body part deserves a secret mouth? Which cryptid is the worst roommate? These questions and more that plague you will be answered on Deeply Upsetting, available anywhere you get your podcasts and at GUIPodcast.com. In a world of blockbuster movies, there is another dimension. The dimension of schlock cinema. Join us at Beautiful Disasters on a journey into the fringe territory of B-movie abandon. We review the flicks that are forgotten or underappreciated to give them a proper place in the annals of celluloid history. I'm the Groots. F you, Hunter. Your guides at Beautiful Disasters. Come along with us for a fun ride. 
May, May the, the Slock, slock be, be with you. you. In a world with too many reboots and remakes, two men will stop at nothing to make it even worse. Join Mike the Hobbit and Tondi as they play by their own rules while pitching new takes on some of your favorite and least favorite films and TV shows. What podcast would dare to bring this upon the world? This is Smack My Pitch Show. Hey guys, Scotty P here with Smash... On your left. And we are the Geek Fathers. That's right, bringing all the trials and tribulations of being a geeky parent. So welcome to our world. And as always, join us or cry. We're back for the second half of Geeks Under the Influence, all things Vincent Price. I don't know what voice I was trying to do there. (laughs) But before we get into that, we're going to talk about the spookiness that is capitalism. Uh, Yes, our sponsors. (laughs) Uh, talking about our sponsors, of course. First off is Amazon.com. It is the beginning of October, which means you are not done with your Halloween decorations just yet. You're going to be costumes. adding things or, and your costumes throughout the season. And those last minute needs, you're probably going to jump on Amazon.com to get because it's less complicated that way. <laughs> and you hate to go to a store just to find out they're out of the thing that you need. And Amazon.com sometimes is the necessary evil to get the needs that you have for the Halloween season. Just make sure you go through the link at guipodcast.com so you can give us a little bit of credit for all the purchases that you're making. You're spending the same amount. We're getting some of the money from what you're spending. Allows us to buy candy for children. That's, think of the children. You mean you. You're a man-child. I am. Some of the candy is for me, but even I am also one of these children. Yes. So you be nice. The chi- by the children, I mean our panelists. Yeah, um, and need... I yes, I will eat some candy, especially this chocolate. But I need and to some... stock up now because I want to get the good candy. I want to be the house. I like being yeah. the house that because I, I remember those houses when I was a kid. Like, no, I'm going here. the full yeah. bar house. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like giving. I just yeah, I yeah. want to give good candy, man, because there was not enough houses giving good candy when we were kids, man. Mm-hmm. Was a oh, cheap yeah. I just want to go to Costco and just high five everybody that's picking up the flats of Butterfingers and like Milky Ways and stuff and just like. Where's give the them... love for the fucking Reese's? Yeah. Reese's oh, Reese's. No, no, the Reese's. Reese's, man. Got, dude. Got to do Reese's. Like, the, the Reese's. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. The Reese's. <laughs> Thank you, Reese's. <laughs> the Reese's technology that kids have today is not the same as my. Back in, back in my day, we had Reese's. And then we had like dark chocolate Reese's, and I think that was like it. Uh-huh. Maybe pumpkin no, shapes. They started the but pumpkin now, shapes. N- they did then. the pumpkin shapes and then like Christmas shapes. Then we got and take shape, five. But now, we got fucking. Now there's uh, like fast the, there's the Reese bars. There's the Reese like like Kit Kat Reese. They're type so things. good. There's so many. Everything Reese is delicious. Right, right, right. Stop right, right. because there's and, not a there's not like a convenience store on my way. Yeah, home. Uh, I'm I now thinking I'm 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 gonna go by Seven Eleven on my way home now just because of this little blurb. Or are I will go, or I'll order my Reese's on Amazon. There we go. <laughs> now I do want to say as one of the, the hosts of uh, From the Mouths of Madness, you can also order all the spooky movies that you don't have hard copies of on Amazon.com Absolutely. through our link. That is, and there are. Every, literally everything. Yep. It's Up, true. <laughs> in the right hand corner of the main page, GYPodcast.com, and I'll send you right there. Now, another way to yeah. celebrate the season and also uh, celebrate our bank accounts <laughs> by putting <laughs> money into it is to go to Tee Public Woo. and go to uh, our store and pick any of the over 50 designs that we have available got, at our you store. added uh, two new ones? Uh, we've got uh, one, I new think one. one new one. No, there, I, there's two more that I'm going to be adding before this episode drops. Okay. Um, I've got a new spooky season shirt and i'm working on a uh, a secret project that i don't want to say in case it doesn't end up looking good and i don't put it out but yeah there's another one that's in the process right now nice, nice. Well. Yeah. excellent looking forward to seeing but yeah we've got all of our seasonal halloween designs that we pull out uh after the halloween season <laughs> pull out after the halloween <laughs> season uh are now back in the store so get your uh alcohol halloween shirts get all your your spooky needs your boop your beep it bop it hellraiser uh, oh, oh, shirt. oh the hellraiser yeah. bop it Bop uh, it shirt, yeah. yeah. That was a fun one. Twist it, turn it, uh, bop yeah. it. it. Yeah, that's what it was, yeah. Puzzle box, yeah. yeah that was, that's, that's, that's a fun, a fun one. one. I think yeah. it's cute. <laughs> uh, we've got a ton of very cool designs available uh, from our stores. So the Ouija check board it out. one. The, oh, the Ouija board. The Ouija board, Ouija yeah. board. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that I, that's one of my personal favorites, no, as well as, great, of course, the classic uh, Gui, Gui Thulu. 
design. Nice. That was the first shirt I ever bought from that you was guys. A, that's a great oh. design. Oh, wait, wait. Have you guys had come up with your own gear yet? No, not you. Well, we did actually, <laughs> years ago, we did a collaboration with Three Notch of the East Coast local beer. God, nice. that, that beer was, was so was good. Really, they really nailed good. it out the fucking park, man. I'd love to do a spooky season beer with somebody. Yeah. So any do brewers listening, uh, yeah. we're open to collaboration. Coming up with our own like sure. fall beer. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Nice. Although it'd be very, it would be very similar, minus like the nutmeg. I the, feel like for the for the Christmas, do, do it like a, a gooey Oktoberfest. <laughs> yeah, I do it our own gooey Oktoberfest. Yeah, do a, a GUI Mazen style. Marzen, yeah, Marzen, yeah. yeah. that would be but awesome. Anyway, anyway yes, yeah. T Public GUI Podcast dot com slash store that'll send you right to the T Public store, or just uh, search Geeks Under the Influence on T Public to take you to take you there. And uh, yeah, tons of designs. Check it out. If it's not on sale, it will be on sale soon. Uh, they're on sale every other week, so check that out. Keep an eye out for new designs. And uh, yeah, that's our sponsors. Now on to the real fuel that motivates us to do this, the the juice in our tanks. We're talking about what we're drinking. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> if nice. only Kyle, if only Smash knew all the ways he's being abused. I promised myself I wouldn't cry. <laughs> oh, no, seriously, if only Kyle knew the ways that he was. <laughs> oh, uh, that was that was fun for That's me. The most perfect song. <laughs> All right, so what we're drinking? We have a lot of choices here. Actually, we've got some some good shit. Uh, Low down, if you want to kind of lead the charge here, what are we sipping on? Oh well, so uh, what I brought? I brought the, as always, you know I do. I keep it East Coast local. Uh, rarely East Coast local. This is like ten miles away. Uh, we got Midnight Brewery out of Oilville, Virginia, which Oilville folks is like literally ten to twelve miles outside of Richmond. Um, this is their Mitternacht or Oktoberfest, and I have been. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it is oil. It is Oilville, but it's in Goochland County. Goochland um, County, yeah, yeah. I've been look. I always wait up for this beer uh, every year. Uh, it's one of my favorite local Oktoberfests, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to bring it on the panel and share. It's got a deeper profile than a lot of Oktoberfests. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it's got a lot more of that malty kind of. That's flavor what to I. It. Oh, that's I what like I want lot. in my Oktoberfest. I want that malt in my mouth. It's very <laughs> smooth. Malt mouth. Malt mouth. Yeah, well, that sounds like it. That sounds like a villain idea. Mmm, <laughs> malt mouth. Well, who, who is that? It's malt. A lot of the Marzins and stuff, you're getting that kind of like caramelization kind of flavor, which is present here, but you're getting more of those like kind of bitter chocolate notes mm-hmm. that you get with a higher roast profile on on the beers with this one. Which I, yeah, you know, that's not a complaint. I yeah. love I love that profile. So. That, that, for me, that is my like that is m- what I look for in Oktoberfest. Is I want that roastier flavor. I want I want the dark chocolate, that bitterness, but because it it it's it's just the f- hint of that bitterness part because the bitterness goes away because the sweetness from the roasted malts comes mm-hmm. back in and, and, yeah. and cancels it out. So they oh, do yeah. a really great job with this. And What's I saw them post stuff like a month ago about it. And I think it was just at the brewery. They didn't actually, I think, start distributing it until like a week ago. And I'm like, yeah. Nice. Get a couple of these four packs. And what's that ABV on that? Uh, this one isn't relatively bad. It's a, it's a standard Oktoberfest, five point five percent. Okay, great. I mean, most Oktoberfests, the highest I've ever seen is like six and a half. Yeah, yeah, that's like they're that's not pretty standard. They're not crazy. So, so. now yeah. uh, the other one that it's going to be a clusterfuck of different uh, ones because I did a variety pack because we're talking Vincent Price. You want spooky and you want a lot of different kinds of of, of choices there because he's so prolific. Mm-hmm. So it's a four pack, all from Adroit Theory. We've talked about it on the show before. Adroit Theory is like a heavy metal brewery out of, I think, Purcellville, Virginia. It's East Coast local. East Coast local shit. Yeah. And uh, it's a very cool brewery. If you ever, it's, it looks like it's a where like a new ish warehouse district that people like rich people would park their boats. <laughs> like, oh. It's just this <laughs> nondescript warehouses. And then you pull in and you walk in and then it's just like blasting metal and like manifestos in the wall and everybody wearing the like GI caps with the nice. like black armband tattoos and talking about like fucking slayer and shit and drinking really good beer so it's it's a great time and uh the staff there's absolutely rad 
and their beer is incredible. Like I, I don't think I've had something from Adrite that I didn't at least appreciate. So you're, you're, you're saying that I would fit in. Yes, he's, in your <laughs> obituary shirt. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm wearing camo shorts and an obituary shirt. I feel like I'm like who dis? You're wearing. I think we would all fit in. You're wearing really? the uniform fair, fair. right now. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, I'm you're just in think, uniform right yeah, now. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. You, I think you, I'm in you'd uniform. Be confused for somebody working there. I think. Uh, <laughs> when you walk in. Excuse no, me, can I get some more of the? Uh, no, just just a customer. No, I'm yeah, just yeah, drinking. Yeah, just drinking. Just drinking. <laughs> but yeah, we've got uh, four different. I think they're all IPAs. They're all I think hazy IPAs as well. Uh, the four pack, or in, I've got a hazy imperial India Pale Ale by the name of Memories Change Their Shape. And uh, yeah, I believe all of these have more that floral, fruity approach mm-hmm. profile that um, is more my speed on IPAs. So this, yeah. this is, is um, tasty. My my, I also have a hazy imperial IPA, and I believe it's either that's. EOC or it's EBK? I'm EBK, not... I think. Okay, it's EBK, and this is just fucking delicious. Yes. Nice. These are good. I'm I've, loving this. I've got Auto Immolation, which is also an imper- a hazy Imperial India Pale Ale. And by the way, just in case you're worried about like what you might pair these with, <laughs> they list suggestions for food, cheese, cigars, and music on the side. I, w- I will say I might have had uh, multiple Adroids where I... Have paired it with the cheese and cigar, <laughs> because like I look at my, I have I have a very I have a fairly good lo- cigar so, uh, selection and I, multiple times I've seen my cigars I have listed here. I'm like, sweet, know what oh, I'm great. doing? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But also love like great. how fun oh, a work you. meeting is that? You work at a brewery, which a already rad as shit. But then secondary is like, all right, we've got to eat a bunch of food and cheese and smoke a bunch of cigars and figure out which goes best yeah. and blast a bunch of metal yeah. and figure out what goes well with I what. Couldn't be, I wouldn't be mad at that at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> wow. No. So you have the black IPA, right, Fabian? Oh, uh, yes, I do. Whoa. What's funny is okay, <laughs> this, okay, I'm sorry. We're over here taste testing, and I just had an amazing taste of Invisible Art, uh, the Black India Pale Ale, and this is delicious. Yeah. Wow! Yeah, you guys. I got, I, I, uh, yeah. I'm interested. I thought I tried them all before, uh, before we went on live, and thank you. I missed this one, and this one, uh, that knocks my hat off. I really like a good like black IPA. That is mm-hmm. definitely in my that's like my preferred good. method of IPA. Holy fuck balls! Yeah, right? that's a lot of taste. Wow! This is delicious, absolutely delicious. Oh and my and God. I and you know we're I'm looking at these. These have great art. All oh. of the bottles have a beautiful artwork on them. So there's so much additional consideration wow. yes. with these beers Stupid of like good. From yeah. everything from the pairings to having really cool labels. Yeah, uh, very cool names for this. I mean, th- this is a well curated. This is a uh, thought through. Bre- concept. Yeah, very. Yeah. The concept is very well uh, thought through. It's very cohesive with the other beers in their in their selections. Um, and also. I don't think I've had a beer from here that I didn't at least appreciate it. I've had Mm -hmm. beers that weren't my thing specifically, Mm -hmm. but I can understand why they were good for other people's tastes. Yeah. Um, But for the most part, and that's few and far between. Most of them, I was like, yeah, no, fuck, I'll drink the shit out of this. Even their bar, they have barley wines there Mm -hmm. that are like dangerous as fuck because they're like 15 or 16 (laughs) percent. They're like normally barley wines have a stank on them that lets you know, like, no, this is like high ABV, but you're telling me it's smooth. Oh, that it's, it's. I mean, it's it's a lot of flavor, a whole lot of flavor, but fuck, it's very tasty. Yeah, Ooh, yeah. And, like and you know they pair well with each other. Also, I yeah, just these, I just had a sip. Just, I just had a sip of the invisible right? art, and it and it was full of taste, and I felt like I was eating a meal. Like it's You're delicious. Right? And then. I because I'm sampling here, I had a taste of the auto immolation, mm-hmm. and it was like, ooh, that was a good chaser actually because it's kind of fruity and it's yeah. really light not true yeah because yeah the, uh, the invisible is very robust dark, yes. and yeah like it, it's very it's like almost it, like if you coffee. like dark coffee mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. very dark coffee notes to that's it. fucking yeah. good though it's yeah. so fucking good oh, wow man. oh okay so yeah, yeah uh Adric good Theory, booze like always booze already tonight. been a fan but like this just reinforces yes that, yeah it's such a cool brewery definitely it's, check it, them out it says vint hill virginia so what uh, we're saying i mean it's probably in that region i don't know what brought us a uh, uh, beer from a brewery that's as multifaceted and talented as Vincent Price. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's oh, actually you tied it in. Well nice. done. <laughs> Speaking of, I did want to get into on the second half here with Vincent Price the conversation about how uh, he was of the era where 
Uh, there wasn't a lot of discussion about your personal life and what it included and mm-hmm. your uh, and your your sexuality, your identity, and what that uh, was like. And that recently came out um, in, a, in a great way from mm-hmm. a book written by his daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, Victoria Price. Victoria Price. Well, she tried to get an interview early on with... Yeah, I need to double... I need to swing back around to that yeah. again. Because she, she actually did a, a speaking engagement in Richmond a few years back. And we were talking with her about mm-hmm. uh, coming on the show. And just time didn't allow for it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, But she was lovely to, to uh, chat with via email. And so, yeah, I definitely oh, need wonderful. to check on that. So No. Yeah, no, I... I really love i loved listening to her talk about her father and the love that she has for him and um like some of the stuff that i was reading um n- denotes that like he first shared his experiences um with other men with her like relating to her when she came out to him as as a lesbian which i think is really wonderful for you know to you know to meet this person that you love with fear that you might be rejected and like you like be... vaginas i like dick cool <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing that I love about Vincent Price and about like the things that she has included <laughs> about her father is she has included information about him from his whole life and the learning curve of him unlearning things and adjusting his viewpoints accordingly because, like, she talked about how, like, you know, when he was young and traveling Europe and saw all the problems, like, at first he thought that like Hitler might be a good thing. And then when he saw what happened, he was like, fuck all that and swung aggressively liberally to the point where he was gray listed during the McCarthy era. And so she, and she was like, and I don't talk about that part of my father's history to, you know, slander him. I talk about it because it is important to show someone that someone like my father can grow and learn and change and that these things need to be possible for everyone. And um, I thought that that was a really lovely thing because we're talking about an actor that, you know, spans genres, spans decades. art forms, Fucking decades. spans decades, has worked with everyone from Orson Welles to Tim Burton yeah. Um, yeah. and everyone in between. And that he he spent his whole life always refining um, not just his palette, but learning about humans and learning about about them through art. And I think that that's one of my favorite things about him. I think that's absolutely 100% true. And you think about the different types of characters that Vincent Price played. Mm -hmm. He ran the gamut from truly demented, like Mm -hmm. evil intended, uh, like anti-society characters to the other end of like wanting more from humanity and wanting to like show the, like even literally trying to put the goodness of humanity into inanimate objects in like, yeah. let's say Edward Scissorhands, um, that there was so many ways that he was communicating the conversation about what it is to be human, what the mm-hmm. human spirit in, entails in his, in his stories uh, and the, in the roles that he played. I think that's part of the reason why he was probably so drawn to those Ed, Edgar Allan Poe mm-hmm. stories, mm-hmm. because that's really what a lot of those stories are about. It's deconstructing the psyche of human you know, experience uh, in, in Poe. So, well, not only that, but Poe was another author. Like uh, Price, love, love, did love his country. Like he considered himself violently American, and as such, was a proponent of specifically different, American different, art. Uh, if you call yourself violently American now, that's yeah. a total. No, this is, <laughs> yeah, this that's is that's Price a, being interviewed. This is yeah. Price being interviewed as an eighty-year-old man in yeah, like yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So to yeah. put that in context, but <laughs> in, in the context that just, he is talking Vincent about, Vincent Price it, with a mustache, being like. You would take my guns from my cold dead hands. <laughs> Actually, he'd be more like you will take my Rembrandts from my cold dead hands, yeah. except that I've already donated a bunch of them to this school, and we're putting them on display to make them more accessible to other people. You would so take that my Rembrandts from great. that school from my cold dead hands. <laughs> yeah, like I, you know, and I, I think that that's one of the really wonderful things about him is that he was just like, no, we need to be talking about you know American art, things that are unseen, and specifically like. Native American art. And, you know, I will go ahead and say that when you look this stuff up, they do call it American Indians um, because it's the fucking 50s and yeah, shit yeah. like that. But so just be, just be you a need heads to make up allowances that, for time yeah, period but, communication. But that was something like he was, he was on those committees and like spent a lot of time, you know, talking about them and, you know, being a proponent of them. And he was also like one of the first people, like he brought, um, Jackson Pollock's work onto the Johnny Carson show. And so he was one of the, he was the person that introduced Jackson Pollock's work 
to the Johnny Carson audience, which I think is super cool. I would, I, I hope the episode is that he comes on to Johnny Carson's like, Oh, horror extraordinaire. What kind of spooky goods do you have for us? Like, ha- have you ever met a real vampire? It's like, uh, cute Carson. I've got this Jackson Pollock painting that I want to pull out. <laughs> <laughs> He's just like, this was painted in 19, you know, just it really breaks down like the, the movements of the painting yeah. and shit. And Carson's like, no, but vampire bats, actual vampires, like, and uh, I'll bring out another artist now. The bat is a detective story. Going back to Jackson Pollock. <laughs> wow. All right. Now, you guys just said a lot of stuff to unpack. Um, now, and I'm being honest because I have not read his daughter's book. Mm-hmm. And so this is the first time I've heard. I went, you know, prior to tonight, I had just seen his movies. I knew he was an art connoisseur, but I had not heard about his daughter's book mm-hmm. talking about his sexuality. So uh, do you can, for me personally, mm-hmm. but also for anybody listening that, uh, is not familiar with her book. Can you tell me, uh, talk some more about the sexuality and what he came out with? I haven't read her read her book, um, but I've listened to some interviews with her and listened to and and looked at like a bunch of different writings from her. And so, like one of the first ones that um, emerged was her talking about how when she came out to him as a lesbian, you know, he was like he shared some of his experiences with men. And then it's also her discussing like you know correspondences. Um, that she, you know, found after his passing and a whole bunch of other mm-hmm. things of like, you know, people that he interacted with. Um, and when also it, I think and, uh, memories of her as, as a child that like, there was like this community kind of aspect to their home mm-hmm. where they, there was artists and, and creators yeah. that were always around and like her, her father sometimes, um, had like a male friend that was. There they were fluidity. very close. And, I see. And there was a fluidity there with just even the way that they like approached it. Maybe not with any overt language. Okay. Yeah. But there's always just this understanding now, that that's fascinating right. to yeah. me because uh because I know that you, you know, you just said the thing about how, you know, how he was older and then you look at the age where he grew up. Mm-hmm. Uh where there's not a there's no easy language for talking about uh, uh sexuality outside of uh, heterosexual. The language when, of the villain is the yeah. language of queer coding. Really. Especially with James Whale, like, mm. got ostracized from, Hol- well, not just the gay thing, but, like, also his political ideologies and stuff, too. But, like, he he was ostracized from Hollywood. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Vincent Price was in that circle. Yes, like, <laughs> yes. So, so it, you, to have to hide yeah. in that way and to learn about this now is, is that's a massive social commentary that we yeah. need to acknowledge. Yeah, and <clears throat> also, I, uh, I've never, I haven't delved into that and 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 read interviews or or watched interviews mm-hmm. to that level. Like I, but I did know that it's been stated, it's been, uh, it's come out that you know his wife was bisexual, mm-hmm. and but that's as far as I knew. I didn't, it didn't delve into really Vincent's thing. But yeah. I mean, to be in a marriage with someone who is, you know, is Especially the forties, you've been like ah, I like dicks, and I like vaginas, and like, but also. Yeah, no, also. Yeah. Awesome. Let's just great. keep this, yeah, keep this for ourselves. This so, and have a little yeah, party. Yeah. It was just, it's just Woo. like, it was just, <laughs> like, yeah. in reading that, to just hear about her, and then not, but not to hear about his, it was kind of weird, because it's like, if you were, if you enter into a marriage with someone, you think that it's going to be, a, there's going to be a similarity within that, yeah. but I guess it just well, didn't come out at, at that point. So one of the things that I, I'm noticing is that when he had the opportunity, unless he was specifically asked about things, he was far more apt to talk about, um, you know, art or cooking or things of that nature. Cause th- those were the, the topics that he, he loved and that he was really passionate about. And that like, one of the things that like I see time and time again is that he really didn't do things halfway. Like he, you know, and to the point where, you know, there are sometimes where he was asked to pull back on roles. But, you know, when, whether it was any of the relationships he was in, um, any of his marriages and, you know, to the even to the last the last marriage where, you know, it began as an affair. Like he fell in love and that was like that was it. Like the, mm-hmm. they were and they were just full force forward. Like mm-hmm. and they were, you know, a team united. But like, like a true bisexual oh, yeah. <laughs> all the way in from. Get- <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I, I really like his approach to his daughter. Yeah. That when she said she was a lesbian, rather than 
You know, in America, I think we have a problem where people are afraid to talk to each other. Yeah, they don't listen to each other, and they judge very quickly. And his no, the, uh, yes, you know, when you're dealing with your child, <laughs> the the ultimate thing, the the best thing you could do is listen and just yeah. and be supportive, and and if you have a similar experience, to just let them know right there. I think that's an amazing thing he did. Yeah, no, yeah. that's that's yeah. really wonderful, and I'm I'm a little envious of that I never ended up getting the chance to come out to my father. I don't know how it would have gone. My mother has been wonderfully understanding, but um, you know, I I honestly like that's one of the things I have questions on, and I know that that terror of um, expressing something that feels it feels like the most obvious secret in the world, um, you know, uh, and mm-hmm. so I I can only imagine like that the relief and the strength and bond that she must have felt in those yeah. moments. So. so he was really ahead of his time as a as a father figure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And in and every, as every way. As a, as, a as, a person, as a person. As a person. As far as for yeah. a, an evolving society where, you know, there's no more no more shadows. There's no, no, you know what I mean? Like yeah. he was like, no, I, I know exactly what you mean. One of the things that, that uh, I appreciated about him is his, his attention and his, his joy of art and his wanting to share that with people yeah. and how he he saw it as a uh, a way of seeing like yeah. he loved art because it's how people see and and so to yeah. i could just imagine now i was never an art history person or an art appreciation person but if he had been my pr- uh, my professor Oh my God. college professor. Oh, the world would have been. A, oh, oh my! The oh world my would have God. benefited from <laughs> <laughs> speaking yeah. engagements. He used to do speaking engagements and would go and talk to different colleges and things. So wait, and that's you mean how... like as we got John Waters here, we could have also gotten yeah. Vincent Price at yeah. one point. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh man. yeah, and he, that would have been. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's how he ended up um, creating some of these like art foundations that um, like some ended up being named after him. But there's one I want to say in like. Oh God, I'm gonna misquote this. I know it. It's uh, my brain says it's UCLA, but I might be wrong. But there was a school that he went and spoke at um, that had like very high Hispanic and Native American population, and like he was so struck by like their passion and like wanted to help them start like this like this foundation of arts, and so he began like donating things from his collection and all sorts of other stuff. Is that where some of the Rembrandts went? Yeah, like to that. yeah, that was. Uh, that's and that's that's. I mean, yeah, the the to have and, 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 and that was been surprised being a collector. He, he had original Rembrandts, correct? Yeah, that was actually oh, one of the man. first things he purchased as a yeah. child. He saw a Rembrandt in um, a gallery window and was struck by it, and went in and spoke to, as a child. Went in and spoke to the gallery owner to and and the gallery owner, thankfully, instead of being like "Get out of here, kid," um, understood that there was a passion brewing inside this this person that he's speaking to and negotiated a payment plan with young vincent price so instead of like you know just like snubbing out a fire he was like no all right you want it okay it's gonna take some years but yeah Yeah. basically and and he he did pay it off yeah Yeah. he did he put five dollars down in like what 19 Twenty something. Well, five dollars is still a lot. <laughs> At yeah, some no, point in the 1900s, because yeah. that was that was the Great Depression. That was, yeah, <laughs> early, yeah. Was it Great was, Depression, it was so. early in, in yeah. the 1900s, and th- he paid it off bit by bit. And mm-hmm. so the first piece of art that came into his collection was this Rembrandt. Does and it have so original was, Rembrandts? And yeah. then not only that, but to realize the importance, because that story alone is yeah. why he probably donated them. Was like he understands yeah. you can't you can't snuff out the fire inside right like you've got to like hopefully him donating it and someone else will see it and it'll just it'll just yes, and they've got inferno right but very exciting not just the fire inside but to be able to see other people's fires yes. through yeah. their art that 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 now that yeah. just really a language through really the, yeah. the idea that uh that you that art could be uh, a way of seeing through someone uh, someone's eyes and to learn about that person, how they express themselves. And yeah. these are all things that he uh, had a great appreciation for. Mm-hmm. And so that's, it just blows my mind that, you know, I recall times recently in the news where they were talking about cutting art programs from schools Ugh, and yeah, the, the yeah. money needs to go into math and, and, and math and reading and, and these things. But, you know, um, are important, snuffing, but those you things are important, but can't. snuffing out uh, that which makes us individuals. I feel uh, like just, I can 
pretty it's confident terrifying. to say that without the arts, I'd be dead right now. Well, oh, I, I think yes. it's more, more so than just understanding our individuality, but it's also understanding perspective in a way that we can un- appreciate another person's otherness yeah, in, in, yes. a, in a positive fashion as, yeah. as opposed to something to be feared. We can celebrate. Yes. I mean, there, there's something yeah. human in the, in the fundamental level of not, wanting to or being threatened by something that you don't know that's mm-hmm. the, the the shadows outside of the bonfire in the caveman days you know yes. mm-hmm. yeah. but that's kind of the beauty of art it is it explains how even with our fundamental differences there's a commonness of our human experience that we all have and to erase that to take away art programs music programs ways that people express that perspective you're taking away people's ability to empathize and find mm-hmm. perspective mm-hmm. and right. Yes. It's so dangerous to do that. And that was really just such an anti like something like that would be so antithesis to everything that Price I- I'm gonna say is, because like even thinking about him, knowing all the things I know now, because one of the other like I guess semi unusual jobs or things that I didn't know about him, um, when I started doing a little bit of extra research is that one of the other positions he held is that he worked with Sears Roebuck to help um people across America actually like because like engage more in a relationship with art like helped like bring thousands of different things into their collection um to be sold as original artworks as prints all wow. sorts of other things mm-hmm. so he is re- he is was like the spearhead of that um and it's definitely worth looking into cuz i had no idea and i think that's super cool and you know what's fucking awesome is this still ties into the first half where we talked about everything that came after him and how it's everything's built mm-hmm. upon itself what he was doing, he was building upon fucking 1400s Renaissance fucking Da Vinci, Michelangelo. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was building upon exactly. that mentality of what art can do yeah. when yeah. we had to have a complete revamp, which was the Renaissance, is that transferred to different countries at different times, right? Yes. Spain went through at a different time than, you know, Italy did and so on and so forth. But um, that, that he literally, w- that's, because I was thinking when that came up, is like, what was his, th- what was he trying to, move forward into the future yes. and that's it seems now more than ever that's what he was trying to do that's Absolutely. where his was you know you hit on a huge point there because art i think the way he saw it art yes it is a way to see and learn about other people like the artists themselves but it's also a way of capturing history yeah because when you have created a great piece of art you're creating it in a, per, a specific political situation or a specific world mm-hmm. situation at a specific time. And so when you create art in that way, and he completely understood this, you're capturing moments in time and you're preserving them. So people who don't appreciate a certain art, uh, an art form from say the, the 1700s, they'll look and they'll go, oh, that's, you know, I wish it was more this way or more that way. When the truth is, no, they captured it as it was meant to be at during mm-hmm. the 1700s yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. also art and this is something that fabian you know i talked about before we started recording is that uh history is perspective uh mm-hmm. it's usually mm-hmm. written by the people that won uh, <laughs> a lot of the time but it's written, always but, written by the victor it's oh, yeah. always written by the victor but what isn't always written by the victor is art yeah, and true. there are mm-hmm. so many aspects of history that we see through the lens of the art that's being created at that time that has a different context from the history passages that we're reading from that time. We're seeing common folk and their reaction to things happening in that time, like how that develops uh, in culture and art and and the funnel of different, uh, like the blending of cultures between two different groups. Like you see that progression historically through art in a way that you don't see necessarily in the history books. Yes. Well, that also even relates to, you know, because Price had such a varied and widespread career through like, um, you know, I would say like the heyday and the golden age of Hollywood, the first hundred years of Hollywood, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of the same transitions in the language of horror because, um, you know, the, the, the way that fear and the way that discussions are held through film was unique to each of those segments. And while they are, you know, some of them are muted by the Hayes code and some of the other, you know, um, blasphemous restrictions that you know damnable conservatives lent to artists voices when they could control them. this is making me think and therefore it scares me <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you know oh, I, i'm just saying that like oh. that horror in particular has always held um 
varied and staunch reflections of the climate in which it's made mm-hmm. and also contains echoes it's, of the past and the future. Mm, it's always yes. been the mm-hmm. ultimate outlet yeah. for what nobody wants to fucking talk about. Yeah. yeah. I, what I, nobody I wants to talk about. I that's what I love about horror is that horror is it gets a pass. Yeah. Uh because it's a it's supposed to be yes. shocking and it's yes. supposed to be painful yeah. and it's supposed to be horror. It is and the so other. when it you should exist yeah, in the other. you're allowed to say whatever you want in horror. And that's why we have so many very Yeah, but forms nowadays of they're just making it political. Yeah. They're just yeah. making horror political nowadays. Yeah. Oh. So you're saying oh, that God. Witchfinder General that came out in 1968 <laughs> right. about Matthew Hopkins yeah, is yeah. not political? No, I know. Yeah. I know. I know. Oh, but but oh. you know, horror, horror, they horror, said it horror political. has been political, but yeah. we're talking as, as as a whole. Yes. I feel like, I feel like horror has been me, when horror started in the 30s and everything that happened moving forward. Oh, before it has, the 30s. Oh, yeah. Well, the silent films in the 20s yeah. and the late teens. Yes. yes. Got to well, include those. Things. Horror yeah. has gotta always include Senior yeah. Cheney in his yeah. uh, magnificent yeah. Yeah. <laughs> roles and yeah. the original yeah. Frankenstein monster which was like a 19 The Golem 1919 something I like that. Say. Yeah. Which is actually very fucking terrifying. Yep. It, it is. It, it is very it's terrifying. It's out now, right? Like they, yeah, the you can horror, watch it. Yeah. You can find it on YouTube. It's, it's, it's like a 20-minute film. Like, horrifying. It's not, it's like not the, long. What they had to use for effects and prosthetics was, yeah. oh, God. It yeah. just yeah. looks, yeah, it's ghastly. But uh, everything horror has been moving forward. It mm-hmm. has always been the thing f- uh, of the outlier. It is always that. That's what its purpose is. Yeah, in my yes. mind, anyway, I could be wrong, but that is what is always meant to it's me. It's always been honesty. Horror honesty, is, yeah, exactly. Is but honesty the is the outlier. Yes. Nobody Looks, wants honesty. They say uh, they do, but when they get it, they don't fucking like it. Exactly. Nobody wants honesty. I, okay, so before we end this episode, yeah. I have to ask this question. If you are introducing someone You're to not Vincent the host- Price, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I know, but I'm nosy, and that's why I'm. <laughs> this is what happens you. when there's too many hosts in the kitchen. Is that? Uh, no, I'm kidding. I'll, I'm, I'll shut the fuck up. No, right actually, here. this is making my job. I easier. don't think you could if you really wanted like, to, though. I could. No, just... you, no, no, you couldn't. Are you? You love it so much. Me? No, it's just you love it so much that you couldn't do it. It would just still come out. It would just look like I was pouting. You guys would be really confused why the fuck I came over here to pout in the corner. <laughs> no, hey, look at your baby to explode. Like, <laughs> okay, but I want to hear what you were going to yeah, say. I do. No, I do want to hear. Yes. No, just... Because you've got such a wide span of options, if you are going to introduce someone to Vincent Price where someone goes, wow, you know, I don't know that I've ever seen a Vincent Price movie. Where should I start? Mm. What is the film that comes to mind first for you guys or I, it, it can be one, one that popped oh. into my brain I, and it's not one of the first ones that i uh discovered it was actually surprisingly i didn't find out that this was a movie until i read the book that it was based on which mm. is one of my favorite horror stories of all time and has been monstrously influential huh, on the, <laughs> the on the horror community yeah, yeah, is yeah, uh yeah. the the story from richard mathis and i am legend that that oh, Vincent yeah. Price was in Earth. The Last Man on Earth, yeah. which to this day is still the most faithful adaptation to the book that has come out. And yeah. we're talking about like Omega Man is based on that very loosely. Let's um, let's not talk about I, the CGI I, vampires. I, I am legend. Let's, no, let's not talk about the CGI loosely, vampires. No. Oh, very loosely on related oh, uh, to that as well. God. But I, um, Last Man on Earth with Vincent Price, so and good. you can find the black and, original black and white and the uh, colorized version they have mm-hmm. as well now. I, I prefer the black and white. I prefer honestly. the black and white. I do prefer I the black and white. I do like that the early versions that I had before it got popularized uh, were like bleached out as fuck, and it was really bad versions of it. And now you can find a really good, like like clean black and white version of it mm-hmm. that looks you can see everybody and i'm not everything. a huge I, I'm, I'm, I'm not like it's gotta be black and white no it's just like it just it f- that fit that film in black and white just fits better than the, it does in color it's hitting so many marks mm-hmm. that vincent price was good at is there's a lot of narration yes and his voice is fucking golden it's butter it's, it's, it's fucking butter. butter man and so much of that story is him narrating his experiences but also you're getting to see some versatility in the character is that he's breaking down over time mm-hmm. and you're seeing how him being separated from society is affecting a person over time. So you're mm-hmm. seeing not just the like the quaint, uh, you know, very lovely to meet people, Vincent Price. You're seeing the like broken, yeah. like beaten down mm-hmm. character, and he's still able to do a great job portraying that. So you're seeing a lot more flexibility in his in his acting there than you do with some of his roles. And no, no fault of his, it's what the role provides. Yes, yes, uh, yes. In, yeah. that, in that. Yeah. So, and to answer your question, what I would introduce somebody to uh, for Vincent Price, I'd say I would d- go with Edward Scissorhands. Mm-hmm. Um, That's a great. I in. I, I would yeah. have yeah. to give the, make that the end because if you want to introduce somebody specifically to a horror movie, 
you don't there are other horror movies to show Mm -hmm. their horror has so many entries but to introduce somebody to vincent price specifically i wouldn't go with just a horror film i would go with edward scissorhands because you get to see his uh, a depth uh, 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 and a love behind Vincent Price in that movie at how he creates Edward. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it's so heartwarming. And yet the movie is so focused on otherness and the mystery and the weirdness of it all. Mm-hmm. I think it encompasses more of who Vincent Price was than say something like The Fly. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Because, because you're seeing something that has otherness, it has love, it has fright, it has many aspects of it. And so when you watch that movie, you get a sense more of who he was. Like, it, so if, if you were to ask this question of me, uh, how, I, how would I introduce somebody to Bella Lugosi? Mm-hmm. I would say, watch Tim Burton's Ed Wood. Yeah. Uh, because yeah, because right. it's the same kind yeah. of thing. Because Ed Wood, like, you can watch an Ed Wood movie uh, mm-hmm. that had Bella Lugosi in it, but you won't learn about Bella Lugosi. Right. And you'll see kind of the filmmaking style of Ed Wood. Mm. But watching Tim Burton's Ed Wood where mm-hmm. somebody takes it and kind of gives you the cliff notes of everything and creates a perfect movie that mm-hmm. tells the story. That's, the scene with the that's squid in that movie. Oh, I know. It says it all. It says it all. It's, and, and, and actually, uh, Edward Scissorhands actually does make a, a good point in the fact that, and I, I, just re, I just thought of this, like one of the reasons why um, Vincent Price might have, it uh, was probably like agreeing to do this film, especially at his old age at the time when he did the film, was like the whole story is about just the accepting of the odd duckling, the yes. the the out mm-hmm. the outsider, and like Vincent Price, we've already talked about art and with his own personal life and what he's seen and how he was able to grow and change. Whole personality. Like it's it's like it's like that's everything yeah. that he embodied throughout his life yes, in his final film appearance. Yeah, you know? exactly. And that's and at that age, he did not want to be doing a bunch of violent kid, uh, a bunch of violent movies. He wanted to yeah. do something that you know everybody could so, see. Uh, I would say, uh, quick answer for mine, and it's one that hasn't come up yet. But I think that it, if you're just looking at intro to Vincent Price, and I'm coming from the dastardly villain aspect, mm-hmm. I would actually, um, if because if they haven't heard of Vincent Price yet, they're probably not big into horror. Um, so I'm gonna yeah. do an easy in. I would go with the Grace Mouth, the Great Mouse Detective. Oh, he plays oh the, nice! Yeah. Yes. I hadn't even because thought of that. Because him as Radigan yeah. was such oh. a dastardly motherfucker, yeah. man. Like oh, he was amazing solid. for that. Like solid call. And for a Holmes villain, like to be to oh. go par with Sherlock Holmes, like yes. Vincent Price's the voice was ah oh, yeah. brilliant, and that is perfect just to that level that you know, uh, Price could do. On that know. same level, the 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo is another great end for kids too mm-hmm. because, yeah, yeah. because you know, he was Vincent Van Gogh in that but voiced it and obviously was Vincent Price. Yeah. Um, so I was just looking but, at like, yeah. so, I mean, even as an adult, it's like right. say you, you have an into horror, like, you're, I, I'm a, I'm a, I could be you know, just assuming wrongly but you're probably into Disney and stuff like that and you grew up with that so if you haven't seen that Disney film yet at this point when you want to be introduced to Vincent Price, Watch the great because that was eighty six. Great Mouse Detective was eighty six. It was in that really weird era of Disney. It's a really 86 good. Eighty six was an excellent year for movies. We got Night of the Creeps. We got Aliens. Yeah. We yeah. got we got everything great <laughs> came out in nineteen eighty six. Yeah, Have you noticed? Yeah, that's true. There's a lot of lot of good quality shit. And oh yeah, that was one of them. I I love. I still rewatch that film. I oh, love yeah. that no, film. A, I love him great, as Radigan's. That's great. Movie. You get full Solid. blown. He got he got to go balls to the wall as a villain in that one. <laughs> he he really did. And um, he got a great song. Yeah, and, you got a great song. Actually, to be fair, like I didn't know that that was Vincent Price when I saw Great Mouse Detective because mm-hmm. I was a fucking child. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I saw that before any of the other Vincent Price shit. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, yeah. technically, that slides under my first experience with Vincent <laughs> Price. Yeah. Great Mouse fair. Detective. I love that. So, I love that. That's so great. Much. So um, I had Murph, to bring what do you up. got for yours? Honestly, you know, I'm you know that I'm a fucking cheese ball, and that I'm going to either show people House of Wax. Or I'm going to show them House on Haunted Hill. Yeah, and House of Wax is great because it's got such an amazing, monstrous reveal, and because you still see this like care and passion, um, and 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 devotion to his creations, and House on Haunted Hill because I love the trickery of the false ghost story. Mm-hmm. Um, I love I love the the cheesy showmanship of William Castle, and I love that we see a wide range of Vincent Price. And not only that, but because both of those films experienced remakes later on, I think those are my toes. Mm. Um, <laughs> I, like, I feel something. I this room is very cozy. It's yeah, it's cozy. <laughs> um, I think that those are great lead-ins because you can go, oh, 
so you love this film. Well, guess what? There were these other versions starring this incredible actor. Yeah. Um, and so you should go back and take a look at where they drew their roots from because both of the originals are solid. Yeah. You know, they're fun watches. You know, they may not scare a lot of present audiences with apart from. Like, I don't think they jumps. need to modern day. They don't, really. They don't they're need fun. to. They're fun movies. And the way mm-hmm. that they crafted their horror was different. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and House on Haunted Hill especially ends with a strange ambiguousness the, of, mm. of, of him waiting to be judged, um, you know, as having escaped murder, but p- having technically committed murder himself. And, mm-hmm. you know, and you see such a wide range of emotion from Price and you can see exactly where he's he's charming, but he's suspicious and he's someone that you want to empathize with, but you can't help but be suspicious of him. Mm-hmm. And I think that those are a lot of the aspects that I love of him. And also, you know, there's just I, I love Vincent Price when he gets to be handsome and dastardly. Yes. Um, yeah. It's the best price. You know, <laughs> it really is the best price. It's the, the price only, we all think of. Yeah, the yeah. only film that I outright like loathed him, like he was amazing at it utterly amazing but was was witchfinder general slash the conqueror yeah. but oh, that's yeah. because he's portraying matthew hopkins who is you know uh, one of the the serial killers got that got paid for it yeah I, I do i honestly when i think of the uh twisting the mustache i always i like literally vincent price is yeah right i know he <laughs> i know he wasn't like some of the main people in that mm-hmm. role but like when he was that it was like the yeah. ultimate like just yeah, just in that being yeah. here. <laughs> All right. So we are at the tail end of this episode, and God, that was such a great second half. Really. Oh, it really yeah. was. Nailing yeah. some really, really important notes for Vincent Price. But uh, we're going to ruin that by, <laughs> by uh, doing uh, a little segment that we always close out with, making a drunken scene. Oh, boy. Making a drunken scene. Um, so this is going to go a little bit different um, partially for time but also i just want to hear everybody's vincent price impressions you really don't want to hear so on the uh really don't group chat for this episode i posted four different vincent price lines oh god uh for this uh and there's also screens so if you're close to a screen you can read um from the screen but we've got uh, Aramis from the Monster Club, which is something that we haven't <laughs> talked about, which oh, is that just movie was so super, much fun. Super camp, uh, post heyday Universal Monster, where just like people playing the Universal Monster showed up at the same place. Also, and... an amazing animation of a of a stripper stripping out of her skin and being a skeleton. Not it, yet. That, now, I, why doesn't that ever happen? I don't. I mean, know, I'd man. pay dollars. Lots of oh, that was literally a Robbie Williams music video that he got a lot of shit for back in like early 2000s is that he was doing like a strip dance and then he just ripped his skin off. That's amazing. And uh, people were like, oh, that's gross. And he's like, I thought it was fun. Personally, that's he probably funny. watched Monster Club and he's like, hey, 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 I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. <laughs> uh, so we got Monster Club. We've got um, from House of Wax, uh, Professor Henry Jarrett. We've got uh, Frederick Loren. I want to be from... Frederick Loren. Okay. Uh, and then we've got the uh, intro from um, from Thriller. I feel like- I'm going to want to call Thriller. I was going to say, I feel like that's Fabian okay, so all day. Fab- Fabian's like... doing Thriller. <clears throat> then we've got uh, House on Hunted Hill with Murphy. Um, and then I can do either um, House of Wax or Monster Club. If, if Lowdown, if you have a preference, I don't care. Either way, uh, I, I don't have a preference, honestly. That, that's fine. Um, then I'll do I'll do House of Wax then. Okay. Uh, with my terrible fucking Vincent Price accent. So are we all doing our best Price impressions for this? Honestly, like you can do whatever version you want. I'm gonna do Vincent Price poorly um, and make a fool out of myself. You can or Mine you don't. Mine will probably be to. worse. So I'm I'm gonna, I, yeah. I'm, really... I'm gonna go in for Team Price in person. All right, cool. Oh, Let's just do fucking Vincent oh, Price. Jesus. So this is starting off, baby, and I'm gonna send you. I'm going I'm, first. You're going first. All right. <laughs> Trust me, that's probably the better move. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and do this. Set the <laughs> yeah. precedent. Set yeah. the precedent. Hey, baby. I've got. I'm full of beer. So this is going to be extra special. You're the opener, yeah. so you don't you don't have any. If somebody act, if if Murphy ends up being sounding exactly like Vincent Price, you don't get affected I, by it. This, this is okay by me. Like the way Vincent I see Price, it, the save way it and tell everyone. V- Vincent mm. Price has that wonderful grimy kind of voice, and I now 
I am in a metal band, so maybe that'll help me here. So I'm gonna <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna try. <clears throat> Let me warm up. <clears throat> All right, November twelfth at Fallout. <laughs> All right. Oh boy. <laughs> All right. I think I might be ready. Whoa. Okay. Whoa. Um, his voice is higher than this. Method. Right, this Method. is amazing on its own. Yeah, this this is, yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> oh wait, was that Arnold Schwarzenegger? <laughs> that was that was that was definitely Schwarzenegger. All right, that was like Total Recall Schwarzenegger. Get to Schwarzenegger the out. hills. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Instead of run to the hills, yes. <laughs> get to, or get to the chopper. <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's see what what, what this is going to sound like. Darkness falls across the land. The midnight hour is close at hand. Creatures crawl in search of blood to terrorize y'all's neighborhood. And whosoever shall be found without the soul for getting down must stand and face the hounds, the hounds of hell and rot inside a corpse's shell. The foulest stench is in the air the funk of 40,000 years, and grisly ghouls from every tomb are closing in to seal your doom. And though you fight to stay alive, your body starts to shiver, for no mere mortal can resist the evil of the thriller. That was that was rad. I gotta tell you, no. When I honestly, I have knowing this that for so long, like when you got breathy on "Stay Alive," I was like, oh no, that's actually, yeah. Oh yeah. That's, that's, well, actually, that's just me being out of breath because I'm so no, drunk. Right you now. remember <laughs> Price did that, and he, he added the fright to his to "Stay Alive." He added that. Oh yeah. Ooh, to it. At the that's end. awesome. Oh, that, man, was awesome. That, was, that was awesome. That was really that was fucking great. good. Why? Well, that might be. I don't know. That might. I don't like, know. I'm, fi- I'm fine. All right, Murphy, that's... you're fucked now. Yeah, okay, so endure that. Yeah. Well, well, thanks for letting me go that's first. <laughs> Pressure's off. I get to laugh at everybody. There we else. go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is uh, from the House on Haunted Hill. The <laughs> the thing that we share gifts on every time it's spooky season for our yeah. friends when we're hanging out is like, <laughs> there might be ghosts and candy. <laughs> right. I am Frederick Lauren, and I have rented the house on Haunted Hill tonight so that my wife can give a party. She's so amusing. There'll be food and drink and ghosts and perhaps even a few murders. You're all invited. If any of you will spend the next 12 hours in this house, I will give each you each $10,000. Or your next of kin in case you don't survive. Ah, but here come our other guests. Mm. Spooky. Mm, now that was Spooky. sexy in a whole different yeah, way. Yeah, that was that was that, that was, was hot. Yeah, that was that all had a little bit. Uh, again, growing up with like library is the thing. Yeah. I also listened to a bunch of like old 1930s radio horror and stuff. Like, and that had that like like yes. 30s radio kind of vibe to it. Fucking rad as shit. I'm gonna remember that. you can do that. Thank you. <laughs> You're gonna be coming over to my house to do some voiceover. I had just let me know when. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm I'm House of Wax, so I'm next here, <coughs> Professor oh Henry Jared. I'm afraid that the visit of a such a distinguished critic may cause my children to become conceited. To you, they are wax, but to me, their creator. They live and they breathe. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was so good. <laughs> Oh man, I hate uh, you know, last oh, your last. I, I set the bar a little lower for you. Thank uh, you. Sir. I, yeah. I greatly yeah, appreciate that. Out. Yeah. I don't know if I can get like high and nasally. <laughs> you, I don't see you as a high and nasally. Yeah, but uh, like, uh, and it's not a negative to Vincent Price's voice, but he was definitely yeah, like yeah. higher and nasally. Um, <clears throat> oh, I'm gonna do the best I can. I've actually never tried to mimic Vincent Price in, uh, Price in my life. So <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Oh, we all have. No, I honestly <laughs> have not actually. Oh. <clears throat> So I am, so this is, oh. Can we truly call this a monster club if we do not boast amongst our membership a single member of the human race? Oh, good dig, Vincent Mm. Price. (laughs) Mm. 
Who Burn. is the real monster but man? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I actually, in my head, like I read through it prior and I was like, no, there needs to be inflection here because Vincent Price was like, can we truly call this? Uh, yeah, because he would just add his mm-hmm. own little oomph. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah. And I didn't do it. So. But uh, fantastic. Obviously, we have such a love and admiration for Vincent Price and oh, the yeah, roles I mean, that he portrayed gosh, in film. Like, him as a person uh, yeah. and uh, what he gave to not just the horror community, but. Uh, I mean, cinema uh, and, 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 and creators stage. in general. Yes. Yeah, and stage. stage. It's like ev- everyone here loves Vincent Price to the point when they realized that he was a thing in something else. Like it was just, it, it, it just, it was like an explosion in your chest. Like excitement. Yeah. That's at least, and, and actually the fact that uh, the last thing we spoke of, of what I would bring for an intro was the great mouse detective. Like that's how I felt when I realized that was Vincent Price. Like I was yeah. like, holy shit. Like it was just this explosion in my chest of joy that I was like, "Oh no, yes, yes!" Crossing, crossing genre lines, crossing mm-hmm. boundaries. This is what this fucker did, man. Like oh, yeah. you've got to uh, nothing but love and admiration yeah. and respect. And you, <sighs> people talk about the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Yeah. I think I think we need to figure out the degrees of of Vincent Price. Oh the yeah, because Truth. he connected. Truth. He so much spawned and blossomed mm-hmm. from what he established. Mm-hmm. And the movies, he, and he was involved in. Uh, he was he was yeah, deeply it, rooted. I, I in wonder. Hollywood I, I would love to have an interview because I, I I have watched interviews with Kevin Bacon, but I, no one's ever asked him if he was inspired by Vincent Price. Yeah, hmm. yeah. I'm I'm just saying, like I want to that, know no, these that, things. That's man. why I like, shouldn't have an interview show because that would be just who what I ask for every person that shows up on the show. I was like, <laughs> were you inspired by Vincent Price? And I'm like, I'm a clown. I'm like, well. Yeah, no, but like yeah, honestly I was, speaking with Kevin Bacon, Kevin Bacon has crossed over and done a, so many things. And regardless of what some of the a, a public opinion might be, I feel like he's done a good job with the majority of the, some of the stuff he's done, especially when he crossed in like the following where mm-hmm. there was a whole cult and that was the whole thing. Yeah, but thing. I feel like that's a hard turn to be like, what's your main inspiration? It was like, well, you know, uh, for my uh, my role in Super. I really pulled from Vincent Price uh, for my character. <laughs> I'm be... not saying that everything he's ever done be inspired by Price. I'm just saying that, like, as an actor, he... Uh, uh, he well, just, he's of like... the age, too, that he probably grew up watching That's what a lot I'm of saying. He might have stuff, grown yeah. up watching yeah. those things, and that's just, you know... One of the things that I... Like, I'm going to look for it, and I'm hoping that somewhere out there there's a recording, but one of the things, apart from seeing Price speak at, you know, just about art and about the things he's passionate about, I learned that he had a one-man show about Oscar Wilde called Diversions and Delights. Of course he did. That and actually fully tracks, makes sense. too. Yeah, and it makes super big track. Uh, yeah, it, makes it sense. 100% tracks. Reminds me of Jeffrey Combs' one-man show about Edgar Allan Poe. Mm. And also is just something that, like, I just wish that I could have seen. Oh, yeah, I bet totally. it was incredible. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. But on that note, Thank you so much for listening to this uh, episode about Vincent Price. This has been so much fun. Some ri- what I love about this, we we had some fun. We made some jokes. We had a good time talking about the stuff we love. But we also dug into kind of the nature of art and what it means to people and how Vincent Price interacted with that and like really uh, celebrated art in many different facets and became mm-hmm. like kind of a, a curator of it to a lot of people. Oh yeah, and uh, that, that's that's incredible. And there's few actors that have been able to do that. Uh, in in their time, so uh, big celebration and the cheers for Vincent Price. Cheers. cheers, cheers, cheers to Vincent. So thank you for listening. Make sure to rate, review, subscribe, all the things you do for podcasts. Do to us as well. Uh, tell your friends and enjoy the rest of the Halloween pot- season as it comes through. We'll find you next time for another episode of Geeks Under the Influence. I'm Mike the Hobbit. I am low down. Join us or die. Shut the fuck up, Hobbit. <laughs> that, was, that, was that was terrible. Sorry. Terrible. I'm so sorry. Join us or die. Join us or die. Or I will swallow your soul. GUIPodcast.com. <laughs>